So Tom Singer, and it's, uh, as you can see, it is not a misspelling, it is Tom, T-H-O-M. <laughs> that is not the only unique thing about him. And he is a professional speaker, so you know there will be no us, ums, or ahs in this presentation. In fact, he is a, a, a global award-winning speaker, and he is an MC for live and virtual events. So when all of you go back to work and your companies have these incredible conferences, say, I know a keynote speaker that we should hire and pay enormous sums of money to. Uh, he is going to be talking about social tightening while social distancing essentially how to stay together while we are staying apart. He is an advisor to executives, a speaker and content creator. After a successful career in sales and marketing, he became a growth leadership speaker in 2009. A decade later, he has brought his high energy presentations and action oriented content to over 950 audiences. He knows that as the speaker or the master of ceremonies, he has a responsibility to set the tone for a strong conference attendee experience. Known as the conference catalyst, he creates an atmosphere of fun and interaction that lasts beyond his presentation. In this role, he does not simply speak and leave, but is engaged with the participants before, during, and after the conference. He earned the Certified Speaking Professional designation in 2014 and the Certified Virtual Presenter designation in 2020. He is committed to the business of meetings and helping people make connections. He is the author of, get this, 12 books and is the host of two podcasts, Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do and the Digital Enterprise Society podcast. On these shows, he has interviewed over 600 business leaders and others with a focus on discovering how the most successful people get farther across the gap between potential and results. He and his wife make their home in Austin, Texas and are the parents of two highly spirited overachieving daughters. I threw the overachieving in because I know that they are the offspring of Tom Singer. And uh, he's one of my favorite people on the planet. Please give a very warm virtual welcome to Tom Singer. Yay! I'm sure if we were all in that in that meeting room, you'd all be cheering and, and it would and be a standing it, ovation. It would just be huge. So thank you so much. Uh, Kathy has invited me to speak to the Launchpad Job Club. I don't know about every nine uh, ninety days, about every year and a half um, since I've been a speaker since I released my first book, which is I don't know twelve years ago or something like that. So I have been uh, there. One of the reasons I always say yes when uh, Kathy asks me to come is because I myself got laid off five times during a 20 year career before I started working for myself. And it was never my fault. I was never fired because I sucked. It was always some sort of an economic bump in the road. And the company either closed its doors entirely or they pulled out of Austin. Uh, and almost every time that happened, I had a new job within three weeks. And rarely did I make an outbound call. And people started coming to me saying, Tom, you're the only person I know who gets laid off up. How does that happen? Because usually they were better jobs with more interesting work and, and companies I liked a little bit better. And so people always said, Tom, how did, you, you know, how did you do that? And one of the ways that I did that was I always worked really hard to keep connections alive. And I started studying how do different people network, how do different people connect. And I that a lot of people hide behind the introvert extrovert curve going, oh, well, Tom, that's easy for you because you're an extrovert. Um, 11 years ago, I got really involved with the National Speakers Association, which, by the way, is proof to everybody that there is a trade association for everyone. And you would imagine that every of the 3,000 members of NSA, you would imagine they were all extroverts. What I came to realize is that about half of them, equal to how the population splits out, identify as introverts. They've just learned to be able to get up on stage, do their thing, talk to the audience. And then that half needs to go to the spa and get away from people where I being the more introverted person need to go to the cocktail party and hang out with them even more. But you don't have to be an extrovert to be able to connect with people and network. And I always tell people, well, I'm an extreme extrovert on, on the Myers-Briggs. The first time I took that test, I scored a 10-0 on the introvert extrovert scale. And the person who gave the test made me retake it because apparently the algorithm of the test, you're not supposed to score that high in any one of the categories. There's always something that knocks it down to like a 9-1. And I scored a 10-0 once again. 
Uh, my wife took the test at the same time, and this was probably 25 years ago, and she was like a 7'3 introvert. And so I understand. I live with somebody who much prefers a little bit of quiet time uh, during this COVID uh, situation where we've had to constantly be together. Uh, I've been on the road for 11 years, about 100 days a year, and suddenly I have not been on the road since March 9th. Um, and I, we've had to learn to operate with my extroverted deniousness and my wife's introvertedness. Uh, and, you know, I, I respect that. It's just a different way of seeing the world. But it's not a reason not to be connected with people, not to network. Because here's the thing that I have found. Almost all job opportunities, and there's exceptions, but almost all of them come through some sort of a connection. When you really talk to people, especially as you go up the job ladder, as you get up to higher levels, there's some sort of a connection, whether it is a direct uh, relationship that someone in the company already has, whether it's word of mouth, which is, of course, probably the hugest of everything, or whether it's through some sort of an executive search firm or someone who makes those connections in a professional way. I always tell people that all opportunities in your career are going to come from people. And so before we got started, I was in the chat room and I was asking all of you to kind of please share, uh, do you feel more lonely or less lonely since COVID? And it was interesting because the response that you gave is similar to every single group I've talked to, and that is it was split. Some people say, I've actually used this time. I've been more productive connecting with people. Others chimed in and said, wow, I am more lonely uh, than I've ever been before. And we're going to address that during the course of this presentation. So just a little quick extra background to me. I know she read that thing. For 11 years full time, I have made my living as a professional speaker going into companies, doing sales training and team training, uh, a lot of, uh, what do you call them, like customer meetings, uh, users group meetings, and then uh, association conferences across the board. I do a lot of technology, a lot of manufacturing. Uh, there's an organization called uh, the Digital Enterprise Society. They used to be called PLM World. It was for PLM Software Product Lifecycle Management. Uh, I worked with them for years. I now host their podcast. I'm not a technologist, but uh, I got to know their industry. I got to know their people. Through doing those interviews and through my own podcast, I have really had the chance to connect with tons of people at the highest levels, whether it's solopreneurs, entrepreneurs, business leaders. And what I found is it doesn't matter who you are. We all struggle with this idea of how do we make business connections. Then you go back to the 1st of March, and within a four-day period, I watched my entire business evaporate. Now think about this for a minute. I make my living as a professional speaker for organizations that are having large events, typically 300 to 3,000 people. What happened in early March? It started with the big giant events like South by Southwest and not the groups I worked for having to cancel but the writing was suddenly on the wall and within a two week period from South by Southwest canceling to the next week, my events starting to show some shakiness to by about the 9th of March, 10th of March, I had no business on my calendar through September. And here's the saddest part. Second quarter of this year was going to be my biggest quarter financially in the 12 years that I've been doing this for a living. So in a way, I got laid off in March. So as I talk to you about all this, I'm going to talk about some, to some changes that I've had to make. I'll use some, of the, some examples of what I've had to do uh, to kind of get through this. But the one thing I knew right away as we were being asked to go home to social distance or physical distance, the one thing I knew was that we still needed people if we were going to get through. If my own business, my own career was going to survive what seemed like was going to be a month or two months, now they're talking about the lives meeting business not being back in full force until 2022. And even if it's 2021, all of those events that canceled, what they've done in most cases with their speakers is they've said, you can keep your deposit, but we want you to roll it to 2021. So they've canceled their meeting. They're holding it next year. And that sounds great, but imagine, and I'm going to make up a number. Let's say I'm paid 10 pineapples to speak at a big event, and they paid me a five pineapple deposit in 2020, and they were supposed to pay me the rest in June when I spoke at the event. Now they're asking me to take up next year those dates, and they're only going to pay me five pineapples. I essentially next year have guaranteed dates on my calendar at half price, and I can't sell that date to anyone else. So... I knew going into this that my career was going to be rocked. And uh, like many of you who are here, I also asked the question, did your job search begin before COVID 
or during COVID. And again, like everybody else I've talked to, your, your results were mixed. Some people were laid off as a result of it. Others have been dealing with this job search before. Little personal story, I have a 23-year-old daughter. She graduated from Carnegie Mellon, Univers Carnegie Mellon University last May. Her fiance was in the process of making some career decisions. And so she waited to get a job because they were going to possibly leave Pittsburgh. They didn't know. Was he going to stay and finish his PhD or was he going to take a master's degree and go directly into the workforce? So she waited. She worked part-time in a gym. She's really into women's fitness. He ended up taking the master's degree, getting a killer job with a hedge fund that moved them to Chicago. So then she decided, I'll wait till we get settled in Chicago. They moved to Chicago in October. She spent the next three months setting up their life. Uh, her fiance is a math genius, super, super smart guy, but he got this like math genius kind of job. He had to focus on that. So she said, I will get us settled, bank accounts, you know, apartment, everything we need to do. So she spent three months transitioning their life. And the end of February, she called me and said, all right, I have this business degree from a top college. I am ready to go get a job. And she started her job search, give or take, about February 20th. So many of you can kind of guess what has happened. Uh, the gym she was working at in Chicago closed. Uh, she also was doing part-time work for me and two other professional speakers, kind of as virtual assistant, booking flights, uh, dealing with clients, uh, negotiating contracts uh, as just sort of a part-time thing. Those three businesses fell away. There's no work there. So she has been sort of stuck in limbo. And even worse than Austin, Chicago has been on a total lockdown. So I tell you that because... I can relate both personally and through watching my daughter go through a job search or a non-existent one, what you're going through. But I'm going to go back to this idea that people are really that key, that key answer that we need to do. So what I'm going to try and do here is share this screen and take us on a little journey through what I think we should be looking at when it comes to social tightening while you're social distancing. And I'm going to try and put that little piece in uh, that has to do with what you do in a job search. So before I get started, are there any questions? Now, by sharing my screen, I can't actually see the chat room, apparently. So, Kathy, I'm going to ask you to pipe in uh, now or at any point, really, and I'll, I'll stop a couple times and ask. And let me know if there's any questions or comments before I get started. Okay, I will. Um, you, so you far, I'm, yeah, it's all good. All right, then let's get started. What do you have to do to social distance while you're socially thinking? So first of all, the last month, or really this should say the last three months have been one heck of a long year. And I think that we all have to be able to step back and breathe and be able to realize that it's, it's okay. And this morning I was out on a walk with a person, uh, I ran into a person in my neighborhood and she works in uh, uh, sort of a psychology type area, helping people who are dealing with some rough times. And I said, are times worse? Do you have more patience? And she said, actually, there seems to be less because people are realizing that the whole world is going through things. So the little thing that her group deals with, they're not getting as many calls because people are overwhelmed with so many other things. They're not focusing on that one thing. But the truth is, is that we have to be able to step back no matter what we're dealing with. If we feel sad, if we feel lonely, if we feel disconnected and realize it's not just us, it's everybody. The whole world has sort of got into this situation and uh, we are kind of all in it together, but it doesn't feel that way if you're necessarily looking for a job. So in my study of working with companies and working with people, one of the things I've discovered, and I've put this into play in my own career, if you will, uh, right now, is you have to manage the crisis as best you can. And I've found to do this, you have to pay attention to three buckets. And the first bucket is your plan. And this is sort of your goal setting. So what is it that you want to accomplish? What is it that you would like to have as a job? Uh, what type of company would you like to work for? How many hours a week would you like to work? What kind of salary level would you want? What environment and culture of a company would you want to work with? Do you want to work with a big company, a small company? Be really clear. Now, I am a huge believer in goal setting. And I know that there's always people, especially like in January, there's tons of articles that come out all over the place that, oh, goal setting is bad. It doesn't work. It sets you up for disappointment. I disagree. I think we need to have a target. We need to know what we're working for because if we don't wake up every day and say, I need to move the ball towards that, doesn't mean you have to get there in a day or a week or a month or heck, even a year, but you have to know what you're working towards. So I mentor a couple of people and if they were on this call, I would, I would unmute them and I would say, you know, Nick or Jake, what would I say at this point? And they would roll their eyes just like children uh, and they would say, you would say, 
If you have a goal, it makes it easy to answer the tough questions. And that's what I tell them all the time. And that's what I try to tell my kids. And in the current situation, I try to tell myself that if you have a goal, if you know what you're working for, it makes it so much easier when you come to that fork in the road. And I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of uncertainty. And obviously it's gotten worse in the last three weeks with, with all of the social unrest and things that are going on around Black Lives Matter and the things that we have to really start paying attention to and grow and learn. It just adds more stuff to us. So if we know what we're trying to work for in this career focus, in this job search that you're doing, when all this other stuff comes on, it's important. I'm not saying don't look at it, but I'm saying when you're putting the time, when you're carving out the time to work on your job search, which can't be 24 hours a day. It's just a portion of your life. But as you work on it, if you know what the goal is, when you're faced with decisions and you say, okay, from, from noon to four every day or whatever time you're doing, I'm going to focus on this. When a choice comes up, like, ooh, I could watch you know, reruns of Oprah or I could watch the news, which don't watch the news. Uh, I could do lots of things. The question you ask yourself is, does this decision bring me closer to my goal or farther from my goal? It should make it easy for you to block out the time that you've promised yourself you're going to block out to be able to get those things done. So having a plan, having a target makes it so much easier to not get distracted. And I will tell you, I think there are more distractions now, especially kind of being home all the time. I constantly, there's all kinds of projects around the house. I had to set up a virtual studio. You'll see I have a different branding back here. I've always had behind me when I do video, my, my podcast logo, my logo for my speaking business. But I am now the co-host for a virtual conference put on by the National Speakers Association. Their big summer conference for people who make money as speakers is called Influence. And it usually has about 2,000, 2,500 people. Uh, they had to cancel it because of COVID. And there were supposed to be 25 breakout sessions. Well, you can't do 25 breakout sessions and you can't make people sit three days, 10 hours a day virtually. So they took all those breakouts and they have them every Monday and Thursday and they've set them up like a talk show. And I'm one of the co-hosts of that. So now I've changed my branding up here. And yet when other companies hire me to be on their virtual thing, I have to change out the branding. People have all this high tech stuff they use. I just print cardstock and put it up there. I didn't do it today. My, my intent, but I didn't have the time, was to put the job club logo up there for everything. But again, I didn't make that a priority. It wasn't part of my plan. So when I got busy this morning, I didn't get it done. That's why you got to have that plan. So the second thing is, it's passion. You know, I've had to remind myself a lot the last three months why I do what I do for a living, why I chose to go out on my own and try and make my living as a speaker. Because I always thought part of it was my ego, and, and it's true. You, I don't think you could be in my business without liking to be up on stage. I wanted to be an actor when I was a kid, so that sort of gives me that. But I really had to look at it and say, do I do this for me, or do I do this because maybe in an audience of 50 people, Maybe there's one person who's going to be like, boom, that is the message I needed to hear today. And I realized that that's really where my passion is. I like to help make events better. I like to come in and, and speak to a group like you. And, and I realize, I'm just going to be really honest. I know that there's some of you at the end will be, that was a total waste of time. I didn't like this guy. He talked too fast. Uh, you know, I didn't like the way his hair was curling because he hasn't had a haircut since March. I don't even know what's going on with my hair. Uh, little sideline, because I'm so passionate about my business and I want it to come back. I made a pledge in March that I was not getting my haircut until days before I was scheduled to step back on a live stage. Yeah, we could be going till September. Um, the other piece is, is that some people will be like, this was fine, but there might be with 55 people on this call, there might be one, two, three, 10 people who say that was the message that I needed today. And that's where my passion lies. That's why I do what I do. And as it turns out, I don't have to be standing on a stage. I can do it virtually. Now, the reality is there's not a lot of virtual work and it's not paying what live speaking paid. So there's a lot of people who think, oh, Tom, you're doing these webinars and I'm doing some of them for companies. There are people who think, wow, you know, your business is still booming. Not necessarily. The clients aren't valuing it at the same price. There's a whole lot of competition and there's not as many virtual conferences uh, going on at the bigger levels as there are live conferences during a normal time. So I've had to attach myself to what's my passion. I bring this back to your job search. As you look, remind yourself, why did I go in to the field that I went into? 
Why did I choose to do product design? Why did I choose to work in hospitality? Why did I choose this? Remind yourself of that passion and find a way to bring the passion into the work that you're doing now. In your case, that work is a job search. In my case, it's just trying to get out in front of audiences and, and keep being able to share and keep being able to just find that one person who will send me that email afterwards and say, thank you, you were the message I needed to hear today. That lights me up and I can't do it in a personal setting now or into the near future. And then the last bucket, the most important bucket is people. So here's the thing, all opportunities in your life, all of them have come and will come from people. So if you think that we live in a lone ranger society, that is a myth. No matter who you look at who has succeeded to the highest levels, whether it's someone like Bill Gates or, or Steve Jobs who were held up because of their creations of Apple and Microsoft, whether it's someone like Warren Buffett or whether it's someone like Barack Obama or some other politician who you admire, none of them got where they were without people. They had to have business partners. They had to have advisors. They had to have supporters and fans and people who were there to lift them up. They had to have sort of that close circle around them, whether that was family or friends. Some people call it an inner circle. Um, you have to have that. And there's, there's a, a thing called the Dunbar curve, and it's from some research done by a gentleman whose last name was Dunbar. And he basically looks at how people engage and you're only gonna have like five super tight people, your spouse, your best friend, whoever you're super tight with, there's a small little number. Then you're gonna have about 15 people who are part of that extended circle. And then really you can only have relationships with 150 people. Now I get a lot of pushback since social media has become so popular going, well, the Dunbar research was you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever it was. Uh, that doesn't take into effect LinkedIn and Twitter and YouTube. I have 15,000 people that I'm close with. I disagree. Now, I'm not a researcher. I'm not going to defend that that number can't have changed because of technology. It certainly could have. But people who tell me, oh, I'm connected to 5,000 people on Facebook and that they think that that matters, I think they're wrong. I had someone try to sell to me uh, their services and he kept telling me every call we had, he goes, I've connected to 4,000 people in the last three months or five months on LinkedIn, 4,000 new people. Well, that's awesome but a like, a link, a share, and a follow is not a relationship. So you can't have relationships with a ton of people. You've got to narrow it down to that 15, to that 50. Once you get over 50, yeah, you can kind of keep up with about 150 people, but you've got to focus down to who are the 50 people who matter the most in my career that I can be constantly trying to keep in touch with, to provide value to, et cetera. So Kathy, before I go on, do we have any questions? Do we have any thoughts? <clears throat> we have a, a couple of things. One person, Darren said, uh, with regard to your <clears throat> personal financial situation, he said, can you charge those um, clients, can you charge them interest for holding the date? Yeah, they probably wouldn't agree. The industry standard has sort of become, you know, you keep the deposit, we'll roll you to our next meeting for the balance. That's just sort of been the, the thing. The, my contract actually reads, in some cases, they had to pay me in full. But the problem is, is that what am I going to do? Sue my clients? You know, I mean, they, they don't have money. Associations make their money off of their meetings. So I, right. I, I fully <laughs> appreciate that. But you kind of you kind of are stuck as to, you know, what, what can they do? I had a couple of clients who canceled and just said, keep the deposit. Uh, they didn't offer to pay the balance and, you know, they, they're laying people off. You know, I have one client who had six people in their meetings department and they laid off five of them. You know, there's, there's hardly any money there for them to give me any anymore. But right. thank you. But thank you for that thought. I love, I love all yeah. thoughts. There, there are no bad thoughts. Then there's a bake sale. <laughs> okay. And then the other, the other comment that was put on there is really not a question, but a comment where she says, I was furloughed the end of March. My husband is in a high risk group, so we're cautious about where and when we go anywhere. I'm thankful for virtual meetings and connecting and reconnecting with people on LinkedIn. I miss real interactions with people, however. I am thankful to see smiling faces when people share their videos. <clears throat> well, so, so here is the thing. I fully agree with you that imagine, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but imagine if this pandemic had happened in 1995 when we didn't have all of the technology that we have right now. So you are absolutely right. I'm grateful that we have the abilities to do what we do. I mean, there'd be no work. I mean, I'm getting some work because I'm doing virtual meetings for some companies. Um, there'd be none of it if it wasn't for the tools that we had. But when I talk to meeting planners and participants, and there's exceptions, 
But when I talk to most of them, their, their answer is I say, how was your meeting? And they say, oh, under the circumstances, it was great. And I go, what do you mean under the circumstances? And they go, well, you know, we always have this great thing. Our association's like a family. Everybody comes together. So we did two days, three hours a day on Zoom. And it was nice. And I go, okay, it was nice. Tell me more. And as they talk more about it, it goes from it was great under the circumstances to it was nice to we did what we could with what we had to people really liked it, but they missed the live one. And eventually they get to the spot where they're like, yeah, we really want to get together and be able to have our, our gathering and our hugs and stuff like that. So the more you talk to people, it goes from sort of an optimistic, like, this was great, to, yeah, it's fine. So I agree. I, I totally we agree. All, we want to get back to that. I get it. Okay, all that's right. all there was. Awesome. So back in March, we got asked to take on this social distancing or physical distancing situation, and it pulled everybody back. But here's the thing. Alone is not the natural state for people. It's not the natural state for how we run business. There's been a lot of talk about people working from home and a lot of businesses had to send everybody from home. And again, there's a lot of people coming out saying, oh, it's working well, or it's working great. Our team is doing fantastic. And then when you ask more questions, you realize that, okay, they had a super good culture and their team all worked really well together. And I say, what happens when you add seven people to the team, if you have to keep working distantly? And they're like, oh, well, that might be harder because these people don't know each other and they, you know, the nuances aren't there. So it's not the natural way that we do this. And Zoom has been fantastic, but the studies are starting to come out that say it's not as good as face-to-face. -face. People don't, you know, we're not having the same overall interaction of connectivity, that the, the human experience. And the second thing is there's surveys that are coming out now that say there is a huge portion of our society who is suffering from Zoom fatigue. The other day I got invited to a sort of social thing with that some friends put on and I didn't go. And I could have, it worked with my schedule, but I had seven Zoom calls that day with customers. I did a couple of uh, webinars like this and I had a thing for the National Speakers Association, a couple of planning meetings for some of their interviews that I'm doing. And I've, all day long, over 10 hours, I was scheduled on seven calls. The last thing I wanted to do at seven at night is turn to my wife and kid and go, yeah, I'm going to go back in the room and do more Zoom. So. Uh, Whereas if it had been a live gathering and I had been out all day having meetings, sure, I would have gone to the bar and had a drink before I came home. So I think that we are suffering a bit from that Zoom fatigue because this isn't really natural. So one of the things we have to make sure that we're doing as we're interacting with people is we have to get in this mindset is how do I provide value? And there's not a single answer. And a lot of people who maybe don't have a job right now or something like that will say, well, I don't, I'm not working. How do I provide value? There's a lot of people out there who just need to hear from people. But you want to make sure that when you're reaching out, you're trying, even if it's just to be there to listen, if it's just to be a friend, if it's just to, you know, kind of touch base with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis, that you're looking for something that you're doing that provides value. So here's the thing. My mantra has been since this started that we need more personal and less broadcast. So here's the thing. As soon as this hit, the amount of emails I get every single day have doubled. Since March 1st till now, it's like 70% to 100% more emails that I'm getting on a daily basis. And one of the reasons for that is the amount of companies and individuals who have coaching businesses and speaking business and things like that, who are adding everyone they know to their mailing list, who weren't on their mailing list before, and just peppering out whatever it is that they have. They're trying, many of them are trying to add value. Hey, come to my free webinar. Here's something I wrote. Did you listen to my podcast? Did you see this? But I am just bombarded. The example that I use is that I got an email back in March from the local pet store in my neighborhood. And basically what it said is, take care of your pets. Uh, we are in a rough time. Check the, I remember it said, check the CDC website and the World Health Organization website. This is back in early March. And uh, it said, wash your hands a lot. Well, a, check the CDC website and wash your hands like, like I hadn't heard that 500 times by March 15th. The other thing, however, was I don't even go to this pet store. I don't remember ever getting an email from this pet store. And here's the other weird thing. I don't have a pet. Now, I probably ended up on their list because my daughter used to have a hamster like eight years ago. And maybe I bought hamster food there. But nowhere in the email did it say, hey, do you still have a hamster? Because it wouldn't have been that hamster after eight years. But, you know, there was nothing personal about it. It was just a broadcast. And it seems like everybody just feels they need to do that. If you look on social media, everybody feels they need to chime in and broadcast everything. I'm not saying that's bad. 
But what I think we need to do if we want to stand out in this sea of information that's being flooded out there is how do we make it more personal? So I made a pledge back in early March that I was going to try, and I don't succeed every day, but I was going to try to reach out to three people every day and send them something personal, whether it was a text, an email, a phone call, a direct message on social media, a handwritten note. I've still mailed some things out to people uh, if I know their home addresses because I know they're not going to be at the office for 500 years. But I try to make it personal. So it's nothing that could be cut and pasted in the first paragraph. So if I was to send this to somebody, I might say, hey, I thought of you today because I saw something on social media and the person's laugh was just like your dad's. God, I remember your dad from when we were in high school and his laugh was infectious. And then I go on to say, hey, I'm just touching base. A lot of people are having a rough time. How's your industry? How's your job? Whatever. I try to provide value. Are you there? But I make it personal so that they know I'm not just saying touching base, touching base, touching base. Here's the thing. When I first started this, there were people who, I got an email from another professional speaker who said, Tom, can I call you right now? And I said, of course. And he gets on the phone. And this is a guy who's kind of not a big emotional guy, I don't think. He starts crying. Before COVID had hit, he had made some financial decisions based on how much business he had booked this year. He bought a second house. They had paid for a trip. They had done all these things. And all of a sudden, he was so worried that it was all going to fall apart financially, and he had no one to talk to. And we got on the phone, and for a half hour, we just talked. Well, he and I weren't super, super close. He was just in my friend group. Now, I make sure he's okay. I reach out like every three weeks. Now, that's only been like four outreaches. But because I've been willing to be personal and just say, how are you doing now? And he's doing better and things have come back and he's stitching together some money. But he was so appreciative that I did that personal reach out and I did that. I don't think some people are getting enough of that. Now, I asked some of you and when we started, are, do you feel more lonely or less lonely? Some people feel more connected. Awesome for you. It's probably because you have been proactive. Some people are lonely. So in this group, I mean, we probably had, we have 55 people on the call. We had like, you know, a half dozen or 10 people respond, but it was pretty split. Let's just say it's half and half. Half of you on this call feel more lonely. Half of you feel better off. Well, those of you who feel more lonely, maybe you need to take some ownership or reaching out. Those of you who feel, hey, I'm a little bit better connected. Maybe you should think about who do I know just in this group who might need to hear from me? Can we do a personal one-on-one -on -one Zoom call? Can we jump on FaceTime? Look for ways to take advantage and find ways to be personal in that. Because here's what my inbox looked like in early March. And I blanked out kind of who it was all from. But everything that came in said updates for COVID, you know, commitment to what we're going to do on COVID, stay healthy and clean during COVID, you know, association update from our association, law firm, you know, uh, mass mailing to every client about how to wash your hands. Thank you, lawyers. I don't need a lawyer to teach me how to wash my hands. This is what we're getting lost in if we're broadcasting. But if we go personal, we stand out in ways I can't even tell you because when somebody knows that you care about them, in many cases, they're going to care back. Not everybody, but when people know that you took the time to say, I'm thinking about you, it's really important because here's the deal. Long before COVID came along and before all this other stuff that's pulling us apart came about, I will tell you that there was an epidemic of loneliness already going on in our society. There was an article a couple of years ago in the Harvard Business Review written by Dr. Vivek Murthy. Now, Dr. Murthy was the 19th Surgeon General of the United States under President Barack Obama. When he became Surgeon General, one of the things he went to learn about and, and get his hands around was the opioid crisis that we have in America. And so he started visiting people and researching people. And one of the things he discovered as he traveled the country was that under this opioid crisis and under other health Health crisis, that, health crises that exist out there, there was this epidemic of loneliness. So he wrote this article for the Harvard Business Review two years ago about the epidemic of loneliness that was now released in April as a book. The book is called Together by Dr. Vivek Murthy. And he has looked at our society. 20% of people in America, they actually have been charting this since the 1950s, 20% of the people in America admit to sometimes or always feeling lonely. That's one in five people. That means statistically that is just 10 people on this call. Uh, 10 and a half people, but we don't cut people in half. Um, but the thing is, is that 
In Canada and in the UK, it's 25%. So our Western society in general is suffering from this epidemic of loneliness. And one of the things that uh, Canada and the UK both did last year in 2019 is both of those countries appointed ministers of loneliness to study this problem. I want you to think about this for a minute. We all have these nifty little cell phony things. Aren't they great? Mine, mine just rang when I put it in my hand. Uh, it's like it knew, it like knew I needed it. Um, we all have these cell phones and they have on them Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and, and, and TikTok and Instagram and all of these ways. We should be more connected than we've ever been. But when I talk to people at conferences and I talk about this and then afterwards people come up to me, people come up to me and say, in the last 10 years, I feel less connected because of social media. I feel everybody's life is better than mine. I feel more lonely because of the social media than I feel connected. It goes back to what I said before. A like, a link, a share, and a follow is not a real human relationship. So collecting a lot of people doesn't do you any good. A LinkedIn request from someone I've never met before who isn't directly tied to my business doesn't mean anything. I get all these things that say, oh, I see we have 40 friends in common. We should be linked. Why? So I usually respond to people like that, or I, you know, I see that we both used to work for Wells Fargo. Tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people used to work for Wells Fargo. That doesn't mean because you live in Topeka, we should be connected. So I will write a lot of these people back and I'll say, before I accept a LinkedIn request, I usually like to have a conversation with people. And I had somebody write me back and say, look, I'm not looking to make friends. I'm looking to have more people on my list. I want you to think about that for a minute. Hi, Tom, I think we could really be mutually beneficial. Let's connect on LinkedIn. And I say, great, before we connect, let's have a phone call. And the person says, I don't have time to have a phone call with you. I just want to be able to spam you with the crap I post on LinkedIn is essentially what they say. I don't think it matters. A like, a link, a share, and a follow doesn't do it. I don't think any of you, and there's always exceptions. I always get an email from somebody who goes, no, I did that exact thing. Awesome, you're cooler than me. I don't think any of you have ever said, who is a person in my LinkedIn who I have never met? I don't even know why we're connected or how it came about and how can I bring them value today? How can I get them booked? Most of my business as a professional speaker comes from referrals. I actually, someone from JobPad got a job and they liked my speech. They brought me into their sales meeting. This is the way I get business is people see me, they either meet me in person and they think, oh, he was cool, we'll do that. So it's a word of mouthy thing, whatever. Never have I had somebody who has never heard of me before, has never seen me do my work, just wake up in the middle of the night and say, hey, I should bring this person into my company or refer this person to somebody. It doesn't work that way. We need to have that human connection. And a good start is to make sure that you're taking the time when you're around other people to let them know you see them because people feel lonely. I try to practice this when I like go into a Starbucks and I'll talk to the person who is behind the counter. And I will ask them questions about, you know, their job, what's going on. Oh my gosh, you've just reopened. And I try to look them in the eye. I try to see them. And I got to tell you more than once I've come into a Starbucks and because I will do this somewhat regularly and I walk in and my, they saw me parking and they'll have my drink ready and they go, today's on the house. You're always so nice to us. People feel invisible. Some of you may feel invisible. We need to make sure that when we can, we're seeing others. Kathy, any more questions, any more comments? There was one comment where um, a, a guy said that uh, he got laid off right at the very beginning of COVID and that uh, the crisis has brought him much closer to his wife and daughter. Yes, yes. I, I totally think that that is a byproduct. Now, the flip side of that is out in our general society, there's some of the opposite of that. There are some people exactly. who aren't used to being around. Now, we all like each other. I have an 18-year-old daughter who uh, was a high school senior until, I don't know when it ended since we didn't have a real graduation, but she's apparently no longer a high school senior. Um, and I will tell you, of course, my heart goes out and I care about people who got sick or if they know anybody who died. I mean, that's the worst of this crisis. But the flip side is after that, I think the people who got it the worst, I think we're high school seniors. I originally said high school seniors and brides because my 23-year-old was supposed to get married May 16th and she had to postpone that. And so I said high school seniors and brides and my high school senior looked at me one day and she goes, dad, I feel for my sister, but she's going to get a wedding. I'm never going to get my senior year back. 
and she just graduated from the Ann Richard School for Young Women Leaders. I'm really proud of her. She got accepted to her first choice college. Kate will be leaving for Dartmouth in August or September. Uh, and I, if they open up, but they haven't announced yet, but it looks like colleges are opening up. And that has been a real bright spot for her. But everything she should have been going through from March until May, everything else was taken away from her. And uh, one of the things that she did is when she got accepted to college, they, they had a Facebook room for everyone who was accepted, all the new students, the class of 24, and they were going on and introducing themselves and chatting. And one girl said, oh, it would be so fun to have a Zoom meeting where we could get on video and just talk to each other. But like, there's like a thousand people in the thing and they figured a few hundred would come. And they're like, oh, well, you have to have the Zoom enterprise account to be able to have 300 people in a Brady Bunch box meeting type thing. And they go, oh, and my daughter said, oh, my dad has that for his business. And so she came to me and said, can I use your Zoom account? And now three or four times since they were accepted two months ago, the class gets together and they only get now about 100 people. The first time I think they had 200 and they literally come into a Zoom thing. Everybody turns on their camera and then she breaks them up into breakout rooms and sends them out into groups of six or seven so that they can see each other, so that they can share with each other. She'll leave them for like 12 minutes then send a message saying, pull everybody back. They'll pull everybody back. Then they'll reformulate, send them back out to Zoom rooms again. But it's so that they can see people. And her answer to me was, dad, it's like sitting in a dorm room ordering pizza. And they'll do it for hours. I came in the other night and there were still 10 kids on at like midnight. They had started it at seven. And it was just like they were sitting around the dorm room eating pizza. They were trying to see each other. And even though it's only been a few of these, she feels like she's made friendships that may not have happened if things had been normal, because they never would have had the need. They would have all been busy graduating from high school, but instead they've done that. So there are ways you can get better connected and you can get creative, but uh, you know, I think there's also a lot that goes the other way. I think there's a lot of people who feel really left out. Hey, Tom. Terms. Yes. It's uh, R.D. Childers. Hey. That was my comment. <laughs> uh, my daughter turned 16 on Wednesday, and uh, nice. we've Happy been spending, spending time uh, doing a parent talk driver's ed. Oh, God love you. <laughs> she got her first taste of freedom. You know, she first time we, you know, she just got to the point where she's driving now without a lot of, you know, input. So I just didn't say anything. First place she drives to, Whataburger. Of course. Well, duh. She's 16. <laughs> next place, the very next day, I'm like, we just passed Whataburger. What the hell are we doing? We drove to from Round Rock, a Wells Branch, to Buda to get, uh, Green apple licorice from Cabela's in Buda. I, I totally makes sense to me. Now she has tasted freedom. I am yeah. not as good of a parent as you, yeah. RD. We actually in March real well, as soon as we realized this wasn't a two week quarantine. As soon as we knew, based on all my business evaporating through the summer, we knew this was going to go until about at least now is it starting to open up. So we canceled Kate's car insurance. So she's eighteen. She has a car. <laughs> But it was like, I don't know, $300 or $400 a month. And I was like, hmm, I have no income. And so for two and a half months, we canceled her car insurance. And literally, some of her friends would just get in their car and just drive like to do something. There was nowhere you could go. Cabela's wasn't open or whatever. Uh, we didn't let her do that because I was cheap. So we've now, she, she, works, uh, she works at an REI and uh, she's now working again. And you know, we had to turn her car insurance back on, and send her back out into the world. So now she can go you know, get Taco Deli or whatever she wants, uh, when she wants, but uh, I'm not as good of a dad. We've lo we locked her in a little bit. And she did make the comment that she likes her parents and we get along great, but she added, you're not my friends. And we didn't take that in a negative way. We totally understood that that was, that was a thing. So as I go into this, I wanna wrap this up in, in about eight more minutes so that we have time for some more detailed questions for any of you. As we look at social tightening, I have five tips for you. And it doesn't, I think this will help you with your job search, but it should help you with dealing with all of this too. And just being able to, to feel more connected with other people because that connection of people is so important because, you know, because people, I mean, that's where I said all opportunities are going to come from people. You need to be refreshing. Who are those people I need to be connecting with? So number one, take it upon yourself to reach out. I say three people a day. I had someone reach out to me and they go, Tom, my business is collapsing. Uh, I've been you know, laid off. Order. I don't have time for that and I don't need it. And I said, great, you don't need it. But is everyone in your network feeling great? Do any of them feel like they're falling through the cracks? And her answer was, well, I don't know. And I'm like, then three people a week, just reach out and let them know I was thinking about you today. But I think three people a day 
just a text, a phone call, something, just let them know you care. Just show, taking that initiative, I think will lead you down some of that path. Number two, offer some way to help. Even if it's just to jump on a call, if it's reviewing someone else's resume, just find a way to provide value. What are your strengths? What do you do? What can you provide to different people? I reached out to a bunch of clients and I said, look, I know you don't have money. You know, if you want to do a webinar like this, you know, I'll do it. And they're like, well, normally we would have to pay you. We don't have any budget. We're laying everybody off. I say, that's great. Just remember me on the other side, right? I mean, it's like, let's, this is a long haul. How do we be in it together? Find where your value is. And so, you know, that's what, that's what I suggest. Number three, use the tools. Yes. I have been teaching people for 15 years that a like, a link, a share, and a follow is not a human relationship. And I do not believe that for most of us, and again, there's always exceptions. People tell me, oh, I met my business partner. We started a company. We wrote a book and we made $3 million and we've never been in the same room because we met on Twitter. Awesome. That's what we call an outlier. That is not a norm. In the norm of society, we don't have best friends we've never met before. Those of you who are married, you may have met online, but I'm guessing you did not get married without not being in the same room. Now, I did that at a conference one time and this guy came up to me and said, that's exactly what happened. We got married. We never met till we were married a year and a half. Awesome. Maybe weird, but outlier. However, if this crisis had happened in 1995 or 2004, we wouldn't have had these technology tools that we have today. While I do not believe they are as good as the full open society where we can go in person and hang out after job club in the parking lot, sharing ideas and you know crying on each other's shoulder and giving that high five or that hug or that support. I don't believe it's as good being in a Zoom meeting. But all we got right now, although we are opening up a little bit in Texas, but we still have a ways before society is gonna be back to normal. People talk about, oh, it's always gonna be changed. I disagree. I think there will be changes, but it's like 9-11 changed travel. But after you get through security, is your experience traveling that much different? I mean, yeah, the cockpit is locked, but I never went to the cockpit anyway. So after I get through security and I travel on, you know, 100 plus flights a year, it's no different than it really was. Yes, there were some changes and the way we get through security has changed but the rest of travel is there. So I don't think society, once we found a, a vaccine, once this plays itself out, because viruses tend to do that as well, once we get to the other side, I think that there will be live meetings, there will be networking events, job club will be back meeting in person, uh, all of that stuff will be there. There'll be some changes, some meetings, people will learn, oh, this would be better on Zoom than flying to Chicago, awesome. But for the most part, we're gonna be mostly a human interactive society again. However, while we're still in this transition, use the tools, make videos, get on the call. If you're not comfortable turning on your camera, get comfortable turning on your camera because that's the world we live in right now. And then get creative. I told you the story about my daughter using Zoom to connect with her classmates at a college. They have many of them never even visited the campus. The agreement we had was it was really rural and it was her first choice, but it was like, yeah, but what are the odds of getting in? We visited a lot of campuses, but that one we said, you get accepted, we'll get on a plane the next weekend and go. She got accepted, airplanes weren't flying, a little bit of a problem. So she's gotten creative. There's visual, there's virtual tours that the school has put on. They're doing all kinds of things to help the kids bond early so that when they get there, they're not gonna feel alone and with friends and stuff like that. Creativity is what you need to do in a job search. You need to stand out. If you're in an industry, how can you get in front of people? What can you do? How can you be the person is who positions yourself as the go-to person to be able to, to even get past the stack of resumes? Creativity is key. And number five, be transparent. So I started off by being honest, telling you that my business got whacked upside the head and I might be 2022 before it gets back to normal. Well, there's a problem in the fact that I have a family to support. I have things I have to do. So I'm creative in the fact that I'm offering virtual. There's now, she said it in my bio, somebody started a, a group group called eSpears started a thing called the virtual uh, uh, certified virtual presenter. I was one of the first people to get certified to prove that I know how to do a webinar on here, not just to be a talking head over PowerPoint with ums and ahs and no lighting and no background. And I was one of the first people to get that certification in the first two weeks they offered it. But here's the deal. I'm struggling with my business. And one of the things that I decided to do is every single day, in addition to reaching out to three people, every single day, and I don't do it every day, I fail, but it's my plan, it's my goal. I try very hard to make sure that I talk to someone smart, 
So I look at my list of contacts, people who I know, and I say, who's brilliant? Who's an entrepreneur? Who's in business? Who's in my business? And I have talked to people who are speakers, who are meeting planners, who are in the hotel business, who are you know, in the convention services business. But I've also talked to people who work in the drone industry, to people who work in law firms. I've talked to a whole bunch of people. And we just have to start off with a chat. I ask them for 15 or 20 minutes of their time and I let them know up front, I'm just looking for ideas on how my career can survive. And one person I reached out to was a guy who works in executive search for like a high-end uh, retained search firm that does uh, places CEOs, CTOs, CFOs, kind of the highest levels of, of the C-suite and board members for public companies. And four years ago, I spoke at their international partner meeting. And afterwards, the CEO had said to my connection, why doesn't he work for us? So I reached out to him and on the call, he said, I have an idea. Why don't we revisit that? And so the official announcement will be Monday, but I have taken on a business development role with an executive search firm trying to find companies that will be trying to replace or expand their C-level executives. And so it's a whole new business for me, but the business is based on relationships. It's based on people. It's based on being able to connect the dots where other people can't. Those are my strengths. That's what I'm passionate about. Doesn't mean I'm walking away from my speaking business. In fact, that's part of my agreement is I'm not walking away from my speaking business. But I also know that I have to do something and going to work for somebody who can take my skills and help me learn to use them in a new way excites me. But I'm transparent with people and I say, yeah, they talked to me about it three years ago. My speaking business was growing. I had no reason or want to go do that. But you know, I had to make some smart choices for my family and it's, it's hard. Part of me is like, oh, my business, you know, 11 years, you know, it's not paying the bills. But you know what? That's the world we live in. So if you're struggling, if it's hard to find a job, if you're a little bit lonely, if you feel disconnected, don't keep it inside. And in some cases, you might need to talk to somebody. And I think that too many people shy away from making that call to therapy or to, to a friend or to whoever. And I'll tell you, we have the tools. There are so many different ways that if you need help, you can get it. There's online apps that can help you get connected with somebody that you can talk to if you're feeling disconnected and lonely. And I think in today's world, we have to be honest and transparent because it's. An, I, I know in my past when I've struggled, I thought, oh, it's just me. I can't let the outside world know that you know, mentally I'm not doing great. But that's where we are. Everybody is struggling on some level. If you need help, don't hide it. Now is the time more than ever that you need to find somebody, whether it's a friend, a family member, or whether it's someone professionally, and just be transparent and say, here's where I'm struggling. I have found that has helped me get through the last three months by just being real honest that, yeah, my business has gotten kicked in the teeth. And ask other people like I do with all of the people on my daily talk to someone smart call. By the way, when you tell somebody I've made a policy to talk to someone brilliant every day, they like that. Nobody says, how dare you think of me? You're trying to talk to smart people. Why would you call me? Just for the record, people are always honored when I tell them that that is my goal. But I ask for ideas. I started my podcast, Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do, six years ago so that I would have access to entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, business leaders, so I could ask them questions because I've learned one thing, and that is success leaves clues. By the way, a little secret announcement for you that hasn't been made anywhere else, but I'll tell you, after six years, I'm changing the name of the podcast. I'm not, I'm not shutting it down. I'm just taking it a slightly different direction. It's now going to be called Making Waves at the C-Level. C is in CEO, CFO, C-suite level. It's going to be called Making Waves because one of the things I've learned the last three months is the people who are shaking it up, succeeding, finding jobs, growing their businesses during this time, they're people who are willing to, to splash around a little bit and make some waves. And so with my new job and with that, I am now focusing on trying to interview CEOs of companies with 100 or more people who are bold and who are making waves. So if you know anybody who is a CFO, a CTO, a CMO, who is making waves, I want to interview them for my extended new version of my podcast because success leaves clues. Honestly, we're going to look back on this time and we're all going to remember it. There's a lot of things going on and it's no longer just COVID. There's so many things impacting us that are so important that we all have to be stepping back, paying attention, listening. Now is not the time to put a flag in the ground and, and think that you're right or your way has been right. The world's being shaken up. The, the world turned upside down is what has happened. But that can be a good thing for all of us, but we're gonna get through it together. 
We can't do it by pushing people away. There's never been a time, I think, in our society where we've needed each other more and where we need to be big tent and put our arms around different ideas, different backgrounds, connecting with people of, of different genders, different ages, different races, people who grew up in different parts of the world, people with different political beliefs. Yeah, I know. People go, what? No, all of my friends believe exactly what I believe. If you go to a dinner party, well, we don't go to dinner parties. To turn your mic on. I have no idea where I dropped off. I was so passionate about what I was saying. Right. You froze and then you disappeared. That's all I can tell you. Did I finish saying the fact that there has never been a time where we need yes. each other more? And, and people from different cultures and, and, oh, political. You were at the point where you said, yeah. if you go to a dinner party and there's- Dinner party and politics. If you go to yeah. a dinner party or have a Zoom call and all of the people on that call are voting for the same candidates, you need new friends. We need to be in a situation where we literally are open to new thoughts, new ideas, embracing things. Now is the time. There's never been a time in history where we've needed each other more and we need to listen and learn and grow. And so I tell everybody that we're going to get through this, but we're only going to do it if our arms and hearts are open. Boy, it was good the first time I said it, but I dropped off. <laughs> I've got, um, I have a comment and then I have a comment that somebody uh, that I want to read from somebody. But I have a, a friend who's, um, she's single and uh, real estate, so she's, um, she doesn't have um, a big, uh, a cadre of, of uh, coworkers that is keeping in touch. But she had a dog who died recently after she had this dog, a rescue dog, and the dog was everything to her and the dog died. And I, and I texted her and I asked how she was doing <clears throat> and she said, not well. And, and I said, well, here are some things we could do. We could, uh, we could, we could tour, you know, together. We could take a virtual tour of a botanical garden. We could, um, we could, uh, do, um, a movie where you're watching it from your house and I'm watching it from my house. And we kind of are, you know, we're, we're collaborating together. And she said, how about if you, if you come over and we take a 10 foot distant walk together. And so, so I did that. So we, you know, we, we walked, we walked for, I don't even know, a mile and a half or something like that. And um, at any rate, that was, that was it. But uh, she was really in a bad place. And after we got together and shared that, uh, she was in a much better place and we're gonna do it some more. And then one of our new uh, members, this first time he's been here, and he said uh, to you, I think what you're saying is so relevant. There's so much advice out there to publish about yourself. And I think that part of what they're talking about is, um, is on, on LinkedIn and uh, you know, tell, about, tell about who you are, but it has to be something that's, that's relevant to your job. And he said, um, I wonder, oh, that it, there's so much advice out there to publish about yourself to the point that it feels forced. I wonder if there's any detrimental effects of people going to such an extent that they don't recognize themselves anymore. Oh, and I, I think that happens with resumes for sure. Oh, but I think it absolutely happens. People, people want to be someone else on social media. They create personas. And the problem is if I hire you and you're a persona, that's a problem you know, when you actually get into the, the, the culture. I think there are times and a place that you have to ring your own bell. You have to go post about yourself and something you do. I do it, but you also need to be out there highlighting other people. So I ask people, when you look at your LinkedIn or your Twitter or whatever, if every post is, look at me, look at me, look at me, that's a problem. Somewhere, and I don't know if it's a third or a half or two thirds, some of them need to be highlighting other people. So if I see a great speaker, I go on and say, my gosh, this person was fantastic. You know, I, I was participating in this and I'm not saying go do that about me. I'm just saying that give kudos to other people publicly and other people will start paying attention to what you do. I did a thing on Instagram for a long time where every day I highlighted the book uh, of someone I knew who wrote a book. Now in my career, I know hundreds of people who've written books and most of them wouldn't even notice it or say anything. But some of those people would be like, wow, that was great. But then I started getting notes from people saying, I read this book that you recommended and it changed my life. Well, I didn't get any money for that. It's not my book. But highlight other things out there. Share with people on that. 
um, I do a thing called the webinar talk show. When this all started, my buddy and my buddy Eliz and I realized that uh, webinars can be more than just a talking head over PowerPoint. Now that's what we did today. There's a time and a place for that. However, if every single webinar you go to is just somebody talking and, and I take a lot of questions, I try to stop and get, be engaged. Some people just talk for an hour and they disappear. She and I found that interviews are a great thing. So we started a thing called the webinar talk show and we have a Facebook page that you could go join, especially if you're looking for smart people and you don't know where to start. We've interviewed like 15 super smart people about what's going on in the world everything that's going on in the world. Uh, we've talked to a lot of people in the meeting planners. We've talked to people in sort of the leadership and social spaces and uh, social justice spaces. And we're doing 20 minute interviews because we're trying to showcase, she and I both have interview skills. We're trying to showcase that if you're putting on an event and the person's not a great speaker, you could have, uh, you could hire us to come and interview your people. So we've had companies hire us to interview their CEO or their head of HR to get the message out in a different way. And what I do is I put some of those on my LinkedIn. I'm about to put one on in the next couple of days by a guy named Sam Silverstein. If you join the Facebook page, go look for the interview with a guy named Sam Silverstein. He's a leadership expert. And it was amazing. I mean, it's like everyone should listen to this interview. Well, by highlighting Sam with that interview, secretly I'm highlighting myself, but that's not really the purpose. But when you highlight other people, you're also highlighting yourself. So yes, there's a lot of advice out there uh, you know, if you are on Instagram, all these people are teaching you how to be an expert. You know who makes money off that? The person who you buy their course to become an expert. Very few people go through these become an expert courses and get anything out of it. I've known a lot of people who sign up for, you know, how to get rich as a speaker courses. And they go, yeah, I never got paid to speak. And I'm like, no, but you know who made money was the guy who sold you the course. So what you need to do is make sure that there, you realize there's no shortcuts to what we're trying to do here. So I just would recommend go, go on to Facebook follow the webinar talk show. I don't know how long she and I will do this, but you can go back and watch the broadcasts. Uh, but going forward, uh, we'll probably do 10 or 12 more, but it's a great way to find some smart people. There's uh, one girl who said that she's been meeting with a therapist via televideo telehealth. And she meets with a therapist weekly. And she yep. said it has been a huge help huge. brainstorming in a whole different way. Um, so somebody, somebody said, somebody in the question said they didn't see my three things. The first one is reach out. Oh, Sarah's actually giving the answers. Never mind. The answers are coming in chat. Let's see. <laughs> At least you know that somebody's taking notes. That's right. Thank you, Sarah. That's awesome. Uh, this one says, Tom, do you have any advice for complete career changes? I've done it several times and I'm in the course of doing it right now. Uh, so yeah, I think one of the things is, is you have to be a sponge. You have to be open for learning. The other thing is, is I went online. I haven't, I'm, I mean, I officially start Monday. I've actually been going online and just Googling terms like how to be successful, you know, in high-end executive search. And what's amazing is there are people who've written papers. There's people who've done videos. I don't know if they're right but I'm just being a sponge and I'm gathering information. I'm looking at how things work. And then today I'm meeting with my, the person I'm working for and we're going to spell out, out the, what I have to do over the next three months because there's a lot of learning that I have to do. And so I told him, look, I need to have a path spelled out for me. And so that's what, what we're going to do is we're going to make a system out of what Tom needs to learn. So if you're going to make a complete career change, and I've done it several times, uh, you have to get engaged in that industry. So for me, 11 years ago, going full-time as a professional speaker and master of ceremonies, one of the things I did is I um, uh, joined the National Speakers Association. Well, 11 years later, now I'm hosting their, all their online content this summer. If you had said, by the way, in 11 years, you're going to be the one they select out of, well, two, because I have a co-host, of 3,000 members to interview 25 people when we're in a pandemic and can't do conferences, I would have said, why me? Well, I threw myself into the industry and I've learned a lot and I've made friends and I've, I've been a sponge. So if you're going to make that level of a, of a career change, um, I, would, I would say to do that. Okay, here's a couple more. Uh, one says, Tom, your LinkedIn group, do you have a LinkedIn group to follow or just your profile? So I, I do. There is Tom Singer Professional Speaker. 
uh, on LinkedIn, but I don't really use it much. So just my, my regular pro profile, you can follow there. Uh, RD asked about Sam Silverstein. So Sam, you have to go in right now. I haven't posted that on Google yet. You have to go into Facebook and search the webinar talk show and then join that group. And then if you scroll down, it was like three interviews ago. We do two a week. So he was trying to find the Sam Silverstein interview. Right. It will, it will be posted on both my YouTube channel and Eliz Green's YouTube channel, but it takes a few days uh, to edit it. You know, great thing about a partnership is you find somebody who has the skills you don't. I'm a pretty good interviewer. I ask questions that take people deeper. Eliz is kind of the tech nerd who gets shit done. And so she actually edits these and, and then sends them to me and I post them on my YouTube. She posts them on hers. We send them out to clients. But uh, to answer your question, to find that interview, just go to Facebook, join the webinar talk show, and then scroll down. And we try to make the interview short. They're like 20 minutes. So you could watch all of them in a couple of hours. Okay, one more thing. Uh, usually when you speak, <clears throat> I buy $100 worth of your books and I give them out to people as door prizes or whatever. And uh, you have 12 books. Yes. Which one of your 12 books do you, or other, uh, a couple 12, a uh, couple books uh, that you would recommend for my particular group? So the truth is a lot of my books are starting to go out of print, right? So I've been writing books for 15 years. Uh, I haven't written one in several years. So a lot of them are starting to sort of play themselves out from stock. Uh, the main book I wrote is Some Assembly Required, How to Make, Grow, and Keep Your Business Relationships. Key thing is third edition because we kept updating it until a few years ago. Uh, so third edition of Some Assembly Required. And then uh, I have a little book called The ABCs of Networking. Awesome book. Uh, the ABCs of Speaking Skills is another one that's pretty good. Uh, I don't know. It's like choosing between my kids. They're all good. They are getting harder to find uh, and they are, going out, they are going out of stock. I probably should write another book. The biggest thing is my podcast is where I put all of my efforts in the last couple of years. And for now, it's called Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do, available everywhere you get podcasts or on tomsinger.com. Uh, and then it will soon be called Making Waves at the Sea Level. Okay, but right, for right now, we do, we do the old title, the current title. Cool Things Entrepreneurs Do. Okay, shall do. And uh, I assume you still have your daughter's uh, foundation or whatever at, at Dell? We do at Dell Children's Hospital and Rady Children's Hospital. If anybody is a, a looking for anything they need to donate to, we created something called the Kate Singer Endowment for Cranial Facial Surgery and Research. Uh, we created that like a decade ago. Uh, we have donated and raised now over $70,000 uh, through little teeny donations when I speak, sometimes clients, sometimes people, um, both at Bell Children and, and Rady Children in San Diego. Kate was born with a condition where the bones in her head were fused together. She had to have her whole skull uh, removed uh, half of it. When she was six months old, uh, I always tell people that was the most horrible thing I've ever been through. Uh, Kate will never have a memory of it. Her mother and I will never forget. Uh, but the happy end, the big bow around that story is Kate was in the top five or six kids in her class, straight A student at the Ann Richards School for Young Women Leaders, and she'll go on to be part of the, the Dartmouth class of 24, and she is a phenomenal young lady. 